So hi everybody um, and welcome to this podcast for the Radical Social Work uh, course. Uh, uh, my name is Michael Lavalette um, from the Social Work Action Network and with me today we have got Dr Jerry Mooney. Jerry is a lecturer, um, senior lecturer at the Open University in Scotland in the Arts and Social Science Faculty and he's somebody who's written about poverty and inequality amongst lots of other things during his uh, career as a scholar, an academic and an activist. So uh, so welcome, Jerry. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, and today what we're going to do is we're going to start to think a little bit about questions of poverty and inequality uh, and how they structure modern society. Um, so Jerry, if you don't mind, I've got some really, I suppose, deceptively straightforward questions mm -hmm. for you. So they're nice and easy to ask, maybe not so easy to answer. Um, but we hear an awful lot about poverty and, and how the poverty is growing. When we talk about it, what do we mean by poverty? When we think about it globally or we think about it in terms of the UK, how, how, would, how do we unpick that big concept? Well, it is a deceptively simple question, Michael, but as you've recognised yourself, it's a very difficult one to answer in any simple way. And of course, the first thing to acknowledge and you know to highlight is that these are not new questions these questions have been with us for well over a century and more um, some of the debates that we have today and some of the controversies we have today around the notion of poverty itself have also been with us for a considerable length of time and for those who are interested in this area of study and are following up this area of study you'll not be shot of material online if you go and have a look and type in poverty I mean, the number of things that will come back and hit you is just phenomenal. However, there is an ongoing debate as to what poverty means. And I suppose the first way of answering that is saying, well, it depends on your own position. It depends on your own theoretical and political perspective. But there is an argument that if you want to understand poverty, you should start with inequality, not poverty. And indeed, when we look at social policy as a state, a program of intervention. I mean, historically, state policy was about you know, managing and looking at problem populations who were defined as you know, in poverty or disadvantage, and you know, make sure that they were you know, not controlled in any narrow sense, but you know, that they were kept in line in some respects. So I think the issue about what is poverty does stem from how you look at the world. And you know, there's been an overwhelming concentration on defining, measuring, assessing, understanding, dealing with people who are defined as being in poverty. My starting point would be you start with a more holistic analysis. You start at the level of society. And why is it in the world today, in the contemporary UK, where I'm sitting in the west of Scotland, why is it that poverty is still such a major issue? that scars our society, even with a century and more of discussion, debate, and different kinds of interventions from the state and other agencies. So it's a complex question, but poverty very much depends on how you look at the world. And for myself, it's about a failure to meet an agreed level of standard within society. By that, I mean, it is about how individuals participate in society. If you can't participate in society in the way that is generally accepted you should be, then you're disadvantaged in a whole number of different ways. The problem is people could live in a house which is considered okay, but have poor educational support, poor educational provision. They could have, in another context, good education, but poor health provision. So there's a lot of different dimensions to poverty, which makes it a much more complex you know, position. One of the things that's come up during the current COVID-19 um, pandemic, however, in this you know, first half of 2020, is that those who seem to be most affected by poverty, eh, affected by COVID, I should say, by the coronavirus, are those from disadvantaged backgrounds. And there's no one explanation for that. However, People's disadvantage, their lack of income, their lack of good health opportunities, their lack of education opportunities, poor housing, lack
lack of employment or good quality employment all contribute to people living in lives that are very disadvantaged and to use the term that's often used now, precarious. So poverty is around us, it's about you know, part and parcel of their society. But for me, the starting point has to be not poverty itself, but what is a society that creates disadvantage? That's that's quite uh, an interesting starting point, Jerry. So you, you, you talk about, um, in a sense, the, the way in which we consider poverty is a reflection of our broader ideas about society and the nature of society. Because an awful lot of the material um, tries to draw a distinction between absolute poverty or, um, uh, or, or relative poverty yes. uh, and then inequality. So are you really saying that, uh, that, that, that whether, which of those definitions you hold on to is, a, is in, in many ways a reflection of your broader orientation to society? So if you only hold on to absolute poverty, it's because you had for a minimalist intervention or what's what's the relationship between those i those those concepts and those broader ideas? Yeah, I mean the debates around um, absolute. <coughs> Apologies, I've got the dog barking in the background. It doesn't like that question. Um, the controversies around um, poverty. Is you, are you getting affected by the dog here, Michael? Oh, no, it's all right. Okay. The debates around absolute or relative poverty have been with us for considerable time as well. The notion of a minimum standard is very much a late 19th century idea of poverty. And in its simplest terms, it's a failure to be an absolute minimum agreed standard. So if your income should be £200 a week, for argument's sake, and you're £190 a week, then you'd be classed as being in poverty. A relative definition is the one which I would tend to if I had to pick between them, which is about relating a person's position to what is considered to be societal norms. So today in you know 2020, are you poor if you don't have access to the internet? Well, I would say you certainly are because you you know so much is now provided online and there's so much expected of people in terms of their access to online provision. And as we know, there's huge tracts of the UK where people cannot afford decent quality access to online provision. Now, 30 years ago, okay, we only had the beginnings of the internet, but if somebody said, well, not having a computer, not being able to access the internet, that's poverty, you've been laughed out. But in 2020, not being able to access the internet, and so much information is provided through it, is that poverty? I think it's a dimension of poverty, absolutely. So the relative definition takes into account the changes in the nature of society itself. Now, the debate, though, about how do we define poverty tends to be abstracted from the wider social circumstances in which we live. Um, certainly, you would want a, a relative standard because it's considered to be more, in better commas, generous, more progressive. And compared to the absolute minimum definition, it can be. But unless we relate poverty to the wider inequalities that exist in society, then you're not going to deal with poverty in any way that is uh, meaningful or useful. You, you asked the point about the distinction between poverty and inequality, and they're often confused, yeah? Because we can exist in a situation where we have inequality, but no poverty. But you can't have poverty without inequality, yeah? So they are dealing with different aspects of society, although obviously they are related. But there are some, you know, theorists, commentators, politicians, including amongst, you know, the UK Conservative government, would have you believe that poverty is very much a matter of individual failure, character flaws, skill flaws, problems with how you bring up your family, so on and so on. Well, you know, that debate is an ongoing debate as well. But for me, it's, you know, you need to start at the level of society. Okay, so you, you then talked about, about society and about inequality. So can you just give us a little bit about the picture, both internal within the UK, but globally, if you wish, as well, about what's happening with inequality in our society? Um, well, you, you're right to say it's not just that what's happening in the UK or Scotland or wherever folks are located who are listening to this. I mean, inequality pervades our planet today, and there are so many dimensions to it. 
I think one of the key trends of the last few decades, certainly since the latter part of the 20th century, is that inequality has been a, a sharpening feature of you know, the world. Um, there were so many different dimensions to this, inequality between countries, inequality between the global north and the global south, inequalities within the UK, between different parts of the UK, inequalities between urban and rural, and we break it down to within particular urban areas or rural areas, there's huge inequalities between different groups of people. And I think our understanding of this has to stem from a, an appreciation of what has been the dominant global ideological project uh, uh, of the last few decades. It's very much, for me, a neoliberal one. And the emphasis on the, the individual, the individual entrepreneur and profit making is based upon the idea that those who are wealthy should basically be unregulated, be allowed to accumulate as much wealth as they want without it necessarily being redistributed across society. And if you look online, you can see all these graphics. If you take a double-decker bus and put the world's 70th richest people on that you know, double-decker bus, you've got more wealth than you have in the whole continent of Africa or the whole of Asia or something along those kind of lines. I mean, the graphic itself is just phenomenal. So inequality is a growing feature of our society, not least because of the dominant political, ideological, economic um, a narrative and approach has been one that accentuates and drives inequality in the belief that inequality is good for everyone. So it, good in everyone because it, because it trickles down, the wealth will trickle down. Is there any evidence of that? No, there's no evidence of that at all. There's been considerable research done on that in the last few decades. Indeed, wealth doesn't trickle down, trickle down. income doesn't trickle down. It tends to fall upwards, if anything. And while we can say that in particular periods, the most disadvantaged and the, the most poorest, want of a better term, groups within society are maybe not as bad, as bad off as they were 30 or 40 years ago, we still have to explain why it is that generation after generation, period after period, the same kinds of people from the same kinds of background find themselves in a very precarious and risky position within society. Things have changed, but the more they change, the more they stay the same as well. Mm. So in terms, of, in terms of national state policies or social policies, um, First of all, the term social policy, are social policies always going to make things a bit better for people? Are they always about redistribution in societies? What do you think uh, as no, your role no, social I, policy? <clears throat> again, there's a debate about what social policy is. I mean, my own preference is an idea called, I would go for social welfare because social welfare um, encompasses welfare benefits as we've traditionally understood them, social security. But it's also about housing policy, education policy, health policy, um, the provision of local facilities, local services, I mean, social work services, obviously, some will be, you know, central to many people listening to this. So all those things come under, for me, a wide category called social welfare. Now, are they necessarily um, you know, working in a way that's beneficial? Well, some of them will have the potential to help people and individuals, families, communities in a short-term basis, perhaps. Certainly there are strategies whereby people can be lifted out of poverty if there is an increase in their income, if they manage to get, for whatever reason, good quality employment, if education provision is provided, it's good quality. So there are social policy interventions which can and do make a difference. Because if they didn't, why would you bother being a social worker? Yeah. So historically, social work has made an, a difference to particular individuals and particular families in particular areas. There's no doubt about that. However, asking social workers or community workers or health workers or teachers or lecturers to introduce policies that will have far-reaching structural change in society is something different altogether. So social policies can be progressive in that sense, for want of a better term, they can make a difference, but they don't necessarily make a difference. So in answer to your question, in the last few decades, what we've seen 
is a shift in social policy to become much more punitive, much more, um, the term it's used is conditionalist. Yes, you, Michael, will get a um, benefit, but in order to get the benefit, you have to prove that you are working or looking for a job. You have to prove that you are a decent human being and citizen. Um, and if you're not, then social policy interventions will try and sort you out and, and make you the better person that you should be. Because at the end of the day, the reason that you're disadvantaged in the poverty is because of your own you know, misdemeanors or your own limitations or lack of skills and qualities. So much of social policy intervention can be seen as progressive and delivering things that we would consider to be for the good. But there is another side to it where they can be controlling, regulating, hugely interventionist in ways that police people and police particular families and communities. So can they be progressive? Absolutely. But that's not the whole story. Okay, so I mean, social policies can be both positive or they can be negative. You're absolutely right. They can be regulating in that way. The, the final question then, Jerry, just in terms of ideal thinking, though, if we think about the problems of our present world, how, what kind of policies would we want to introduce and how would we pay for such policies um, in terms of dealing with some of the issues, the immediate issues of poverty in our <clears> societies? I wonder who the we is here, Michael, because um, what I'm going to suggest not everybody would um, support by any means. And it goes back to the first point we had at the start of the discussion. There are different views, different perspectives, different explanations, different arguments. But for myself, we have to remember that we live in a world that's very, very wealthy. And by that, I mean we live in a world whereby we're able, potentially, to feed, clothe, shelter, and provide everyone in this planet today with the goods and services that they need. But there's a massive problem in terms of how things are distributed, what the driving ethos is of society. And we know that over the last two or three decades, the driving ethos has been a very individualistic one that focuses primarily on individual good as opposed to public good. Now, that itself brings forward a whole set of challenges as to why poverty and inequality still pervade the world today. But we are wealthy, and the problem is, where is that wealth located? Where is it distributed to? Who gains from it? Who benefits from it? So going back to the analogy that I made you know, a few minutes ago in relation to one of your previous questions about the double-decker bus, so I've seen images of a yacht, and you put 50 people on a yacht or 100 people on a yacht, and if they're the world's most affluent people, their income is equal to half the world's population in terms of their income. There's something badly wrong there. We live in a world where such inequalities are stark. So all too often, we're in a position where we say, well, in order to combat poverty, we need to spend more money. The argument comes back, well, the money isn't there. Funny how the money is there when you know, those who are you know, wealthy and affluent are in power think the money should be spent. And I do think about the COVID-19 pandemic, and there is a debate, obviously, as to what the Conservative government in the UK are doing in terms of the policy for that. But nonetheless, let's just assume that, you know, they're talking about, you know, spending huge sums of money managing the effects or impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. And you hear figures banded around that this will cost £600 billion. And you think, wait a minute, suddenly all this money is not a problem. Why didn't they find that to do something about poverty? Why didn't they find it to put it into healthcare, education, housing, to help the disadvantaged? So there's a question of political will, and there's also the question of political understanding. So for myself, there is plenty of opportunity to combat poverty in our society and on a global scale. The question has to be, why is that not the case? Who's preventing it? And who gains from poverty? So going back to the point I made at the start, Poverty is big business, and there's a lot of people who make money out of poverty. But the people who make the most money out of poverty are those who are the wealthiest sections of society. So I said that was going to be my last question, but I've now got one more. Oh, um, you're exploiting so me even further. I, yes. I thought I'd exploit you. I'd push that a bit further now. So it's just really... So to, to pick up on your, on your last question, or your last answer, therefore, clearly politics matter. Um, the, the political decision making of particular governments, but is that the full extent of it, or or do we have to look 
beyond particular governments at broader economic interests. I mean, what's the relationship between those two things? Have, have we got, in each of our countries, have we got a more redistributive of government? Would that solve all the problems? No, it wouldn't solve all the problems, but it would help immensely. I mean, one of the big debates here in Scotland at the moment is about the SNP's approach to Scottish independence. And what would an independent Scotland look like? Yeah, And they have a very narrow constitutionalist understanding of what an independent Scotland would be like. And the SNP play a, a somewhat diluted social democratic card when it suits them. And they appear more progressive in comparison to Boris Johnson and the UK government, though in saying that Attila the Hun can be a, you know, appear more progressive compared to Boris Johnson. But the SNP have no understanding of the wider structural causes of poverty and inequality within society. And, you know, redistribution, while it will help in some ways, it doesn't actually tackle the fundamental cause of inequalities within society, which is that we're based in a society that is driven by, founded upon, built upon, unequal, exploitative class relationships, where some people's gain is at the expense of others, many others. And until we actually deal with that issue, and we do away with the profit motive and the notion of, uh, and the driving force of exploitation, then you know, we can redistribute and redistribute and redistribute, but we'll always fundamentally come up against another driver, which is working against such redistribution. Terry, thanks very much for your time uh, today. I'm sure you've given uh, those watching lots of things to, to think about and consider. Um, and I think, uh, you know, for thinking about social workers and those that are engaged in these things, thinking about those issues, the, how we, what we mean by poverty, the relationship between poverty and inequality, the political choices that government makes, but also the broader economic or socioeconomic interests and how those perhaps put limits on what governments can or sometimes do or don't do are really fundamental things for us to think about. So thanks very much for your time this afternoon. It's been a pleasure chatting to you. No, thank you very much, Michael, and good luck to everyone.